Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We are so glad that you are with us this morning on this gorgeous day. Uh, it is absolutely beautiful outside, and praise God for such an awesome day today. Hope you guys all have an opportunity to get out and enjoy the weather. Well, we have a lot to talk about this morning, but first we want to get to our birthdays for the week. We have Jim Wilder, Marianne Paul, and Abby Mills. Happy birthday, you guys, and we hope that you have a fantastic week this week. And happy anniversary to Terry and Donna Collins, Pastor Money and Anita Bailey, Jim and Alice Booth, Dick and Marilyn McCloskey, Larry and Mary Lindsay, Adam and Becky Stevens. A lot of anniversaries to celebrate this week. We hope that you guys have a fantastic week. And we also want to give a shout out to Rod and Sheila Harris who were married and we just wish you guys all the best um, and many blessings as you go forward in this life together. We want to thank you guys for all of the, the love and the offerings that you are sending in to honor God and to honor our church. And you can send those offerings in uh, by going to our uh, website and clicking on the PayPal link that will, will take you in to give. Super easy, very quick. If that, that way works best for you, you're more than welcome to stop by the church and drop it off, or you can mail it in whichever would work best for you. Now we have some super exciting news. I've mentioned a couple of times that BBS, Vacation Bible School, is happening in July, just a little over a month away. There's a, a lot to do to get ready for it, but we are just so excited that we have this opportunity. And um, the, the, the chance to bring your grandkids, your children, your neighbors in to church and learn about Jesus in safe ways. Um, now, one thing that's super important about this is that we need you to pre-register. So you can come into the church and you can grab a registration form right outside the office, super easy and quick. Or there is a link. You can go to the Facebook page, the church Facebook page, um, the website. The link to register is there. Super easy, super quick. But get those registrations in soon so that we have the opportunities to plan and prepare and make it a safe, fun environment for everybody. Our men's group is going to be meeting, the, uh, in, not this week, but next Tuesday, the 16th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Um, please practice social distancing um, uh, practices to, to make sure that everybody is kept safe uh, and healthy. But just the fact, you guys, that we are able to, to meet and gather and fellowship um, is fantastic. So spread the word. The men are meeting not this coming Tuesday, but next Tuesday. And our food pantry uh, is open tomorrow morning. They will be going from 8 until 10. And the big news with that is that it is going to be inside. So there will be uh, plenty of volunteers around that will be able to help direct and make sure things are running smoothly. Um, but we do ask that um, social distancing requirements are practiced, that masks are worn, and, and that everybody um, is here in a, a safe manner. If you have any uh, questions, you can give uh, Julie, the, the food pantry, a call at 201-0750. Well, um, I also want to take this chance to mention, I mentioned earlier that today we are having communion. So if you have not had a chance to pick up your crackers or your bread um, and some juice to get prepared for that, um, now would be a great time to do that. And just sit back and relax. And let this be a time of praise and worship and preparing our hearts to hear the message this morning. Now, kiddos, I have an exciting children's time for you this morning. We are going to be talking about sin and about how we can get rid of sin. Now, that seems kind of odd, right? How can you get rid of sin? Especially considering that we have challenges with that every single day, right? We got some blue paint here. I didn't want to add that too early and then make a, a huge mess out of things. Well, the Bible tells us, you guys, that we have all sinned. We are born into sin. Our parents sin a lot sometimes, right? And so it's just a given that in life, <laughs> pastor says sorry. <laughs> 
It's a given in life that we are, we have sin. We have been covered with this icky, gooey stuff that we just can't seem to get rid of. And as we go through life, as we get older, our sin <laughs> continues to grow. And we learn things, lots of good things. Thanks, Ty. We learn lots of good things, right? We learn lots of, of awesome things to increase our knowledge and um, lots of fun things, but we also learn a lot of bad things. We learn that we can make selfish decisions. We can think about ourselves first before we start thinking of other people, and that's more sin. And then we learn that we can be mean to people with the things that we do or the things that we say. And we learn that we can disobey our parents, right? We can talk back to them. We cannot listen. We, you know, we don't listen to the things that they ask us to do. And sin just continues to cover us. And it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And as we continue to grow in our knowledge and our experiences in life, that sin just does not go away. We continue to just have times and experiences where that sin continues to cover us more and more and more. And it gets to a point where no matter what we do, that sin just does not come off. You know, I can sit here and I can shake my hand. I can kind of wipe it a little bit and get stuff all over the place. Um, see, the sin just spreads around. The more we get sin on us, the more we can spread the sin around too. But we cannot get rid of that sin. It just does not go away completely. Well, sorry. If I am not able to, <laughs> to get rid of this sin all by myself, how am I supposed to get rid of it? Are we just stuck with this sin forever? Well, just... Somebody else. <laughs> there is nothing that my hand can do all by itself to get rid of this sin, right? Just like there's nothing that you or I can do all by ourselves to get rid of the sin that we have. That's where Jesus comes in, you guys. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, no, 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 well, yes, if we confess our sins and say that Jesus is Lord of our life, I'm gonna get this, I really will. Blooper reel. We, we will be saved from all of our sins and praise God that we have Jesus because guys we can't do this on our own I'm living proof we cannot do this on our own to confess our sins means that we are honest with ourselves we are honest with the things that we do that are wrong and we go to the Lord and we talk to him and we ask for him to forgive us and he is right there he opens up his arms for us and he accepts us with his whole being and that is such an awesome thing to remember so Today, we are not able to clean ourselves from this sin without Jesus. We are washed, washed in his blood. <laughs> Thank you. I need an assistant. <laughs> we are washed in his blood, and we are made clean because of his love for us. <laughs> Oh, boy. Guys, when we confess that Jesus is our Savior, he is right there. He opens, up, opens his arms for us. And I want to read a, a Bible passage to you from 1 John chapter 1, and it is verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So today... I want you to remember each and every morning when you get up, put on your armor of God. And it's going to be a battle. Every day is a battle, you guys. But that's why God gives us his church family, our church family. That's why God gives us his word, his, the music that we can listen to, Lord, to keep us on the straight and narrow. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to be able to, to stay away from all those sins that make us sticky and weigh us down. But remember, we have Jesus. And he is always there to see us through and to help us. And amen to that. Amen. Amen, amen to that. Amen. <laughs> well, this. 
this morning as we go into our worship time. My prayer for you is that you just set aside all that you have going on this, today and you focus on the joys that we have in our lives, the beautiful weather, the fact that Jesus is there to help us through our the every, just everyday life, the fact that um, no matter what darkness we are seeing in the world right now, we have the Lord and the comfort and peace from him and the strength that we can call upon him and he gives it to us if we just trust. So this morning, as we sing, here I am to worship, just clear your, your mind and open up your heart and receive this love that he gives to us. Lord, just help us to be thankful for everything that we have in our lives, Lord. 
Help us to give you all praise yes. and all glory. song said, we're here to worship, to glorify, to magnify God, to thank him for all that he has done and doing in our hearts and in our lives. We'll be sharing today out of Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But as we go to prayer this morning, what is on your heart? What is it that you're wanting and needing God to do for you? That touch that only he can do, that, that peace that only he can bring, that comfort that only comes through him. This morning as we go to prayer, there's much on our hearts and, and that we've been dealing with over this past week. We've had our life, All Life Matters rally and, uh, and we gathered at the, uh, Jones Park and a peaceful time. But it was an eye-opening time, and many things have come forth out of it. Questions and revelation that even in a small community like ours, there's trouble, there's differences, and it comes at people. 
of color. And, and so we come today and we ask God to minister to us, to help us, to understand how much that we need him and that we find that no one is exempt. Every community are going through something. Every family is going through something. And each and every one of us, whether you let someone else know, you know the troubles that are in your heart. And the only one that is able to fix it, his name is Jesus. And so as we go to prayer this morning, and as we prepare our hearts to take communion, let us know that it's in Christ who is our strength that we stand. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up and starting us on our way. How you watched over us and kept us, Lord. And you have been our strength in our times of weakness. And we come today, Lord, and we bring this nation before you. We bring our states before you. We bring our communities before you. We bring the people, Lord, before you. And not only, Lord, do we pray today, Lord, about the virus, Lord, that is attacking the world. We also come to you, Lord, about the prejudice of life that attacks the world. But, Lord, that is true. Surely, Lord, been seen, Lord, throughout the past weeks, Lord, in our own country. And, Lord, we come. And we know, Lord, that you're the only one that can bring peace. You're the only one that can touch lives. But I pray that this morning, Lord, that our hearts would be open to you, to guide us and direct us, Lord, and that we would not be hearers only, but we become doers of your word. We pray, Lord, for those that are sick and and afflicted, we pray, dear Heavenly Father, for those that are separated from family now because they're in the hospital or, or Lord, they're in nursing uh, facilities, dear Heavenly Father. And, Lord, and they can't go out and people can't come in. We pray today, dear Heavenly Father, for these hardships, Lord, that you would bring comfort, Lord, to each and every family, Lord, that is afflicted by these things. We pray today, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for those who, who are struggling, Lord, I'm wondering what tomorrow is going to bring for their lives. And, and so, Lord, we come and we ask you, Lord, to reveal yourself and that our hearts would be open, Lord, to receive, Lord, the goodness of your love and the forgiveness of sin and new life that you bring. And so, Jesus, we come this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would have your way with us. We ask that you would guide us and hold us and keep us. Be our strength. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for those, Lord, whose families have been affected Lord, and by the, the marches and, and, Lord, and the names that have been said and the things they've been called. We pray for those, Lord, that are battling, Lord, in that with the virus. And, and Lord, and so there's attacks, Lord, coming up on man, Lord, from every corner. But, Lord, we know that you are the answer. And so we ask, Lord, for you to be God. Help us, strengthen us, guide us, and direct us. And may our hearts be open to your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I thank God for his love. I thank God for the opportunity that he gives us to celebrate him and to thank him for his love that has no end. In communion, we focus on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as we remember his birth and his death, we also have to remember his reign as the everlasting king. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. The, teacher, the teaching I gave, gave you is the same teaching I received from the Lord. On the night when the Lord Jesus was handed over to be killed, he took bread and he gave thanks. It also says that Jesus took the cup and he prayed. And so we know, now give thanks for the cup of blessing, which symbolizes the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Father, we come today and we thank you, Lord, as we come to celebrate this time. Lord, as we remember, Lord, about your great love. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon the bread, Lord, as we take that represents, Lord, your body that was broken for us. And Lord, when we take of the cup, Lord, we ask your blessing, Lord, that reminds us of the precious blood that was shed for us. And Lord, and so we come today, Lord, not as a ritual, Lord, but we come, Lord, out of thanksgiving. Lord, doing this in remembrance, Lord, that you have promised one day you're coming back. And Lord, one day we will do these things, drink of this cup with you. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask now that you administer to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In Luke chapter 22, 
Verse 14, it says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. It tells us that he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. Again in Luke chapter 22, verse 17, it says, After taking the cup and giving thanks, Jesus said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. In the same manner, Jesus taking the cup, he said to them, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And when you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us drink. We want to give thanks for the cup of blessing, which represents the blood of Christ, and the bread that's broken, which represents the body of Christ. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're telling others about the Lord's death, his resurrection, and that our joy when he returns again. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you now, Lord, as we prepare our hearts this morning for the word. We thank you, Lord, that you are God in our life, that you are our strength. We thank you, Lord, for the promise that you give us, that, Lord, one day you are coming back and we shall be with you. But until then, Lord, you are our strength. And so, Holy Spirit, open up our hearts to your word this morning. Guide us and direct us in all truth. And help us, Lord, that we might, Lord, cling to you for your guidance and direction, that we might be truly overcomers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. This morning, as we look at the Word of God, we want to look at Colossians 2, verses 13 through 17. We've been studying in this book and looking at it, and it's talking about the relationship that God is calling us to in Jesus, and that he's calling us to a place of understanding that Christ is our everything and that we can do nothing without him, and that he is our hope for today and for tomorrow that he is the peace that comes and the, the testings of life, and he is our strength in times that we are weak. And he's the forgiver of sin and the giver of new life. And here in Colossae, they're reminding us that, that we need to stay focused on what we have received through Jesus Christ, through the word, the teaching of his word, and to be careful that we do not allow the world to come in and steal from us, to take away and, or confuse us on, on what, we, what we believe in and why we stand on what we stand on, that foundation that is in Christ Jesus, who is the Son of the living God. And so it reads in Colossians 2, verses 13 through 17. When, you're, when you were spiritually dead because of your sin, and because, of, because you were not free from the power of your own sinful self, God made you alive with Christ, and he forgave all our sins. He canceled the debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. He took away that record, that is rules, and nailed it to the cross. God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. So do not let anyone make rules for you about eating and drinking or about religious feasts a new moon festival, or a Sabbath day. These things were like a shadow of what was to come, but what is true and real has come and is found in Christ. We thank God this morning for his word that reminds us that we are in him and he is, in, and he is our strength. I had mentioned earlier about the, the peace walk and that how the, we gathered on Tuesday and, and up at the square and we and those who gathered were those that had friends and, and those who had children and that were 
mixed or had black blood in them. Uh, I, I said that with a smile because I found out that no matter who cuts, we all bleed red. But there seems to be a difference when they look at the outness uh, of our skin. I was looking at this word, and, and as Paul has been sharing with us, that how that in Scripture, that we sometimes get sidetracked and we lose sight of who we are and what we're supposed to be. And sometimes it's hard because we are tested and tried in many ways. And so this week there's been a lot of things put on Facebook, a lot of things that have been said. There have been those who have spoken what they feel, and, and there's been those who have received hurt from the things that have been said. And in the midst of this, somehow I found myself somehow being um, led to meet the situation that we face. And all I could bring to the table was that that I knew, and his name is Jesus. I sympathize with, with those who have been challenged, because why? I'm not exempt, and nor is anyone else of color. But sometimes we can make fun of those who are too short, too fat, too this or too that. Because we, while we're always looking for somebody that we can one up for ourselves to think that somehow I got it made because you lack something or because of who you are. And so this walk was a peaceful walk. It was a walk that gathered where people came in our community. People that some I knew and some I didn't. Some I knew of their background and some that I didn't. But those that gathered also met people that they were meeting for the first time. We saw brown little children uh, loving and caring and meeting people for the first time. And it, and it was a great time. And what they found was that they had this one thing in common. Parents had seen their children hurt by things that were hurtful that was spoken about them and against them. And yet in the midst of it, what I found was that there was a coming together, that they knew that there was support for them. One of the things and the main message was spoken of that, that there's foolishness in the world and you can't stop foolishness. But what it was was also for the parents to understand that they have a great responsibility to protect, to guard, and watch over their sons and daughters, but also encourage them to let them know that words do hurt, but people cannot stop you from achieving great goals. I'm blessed today to say that I've been the pastor now uh, nine years today, and I thank God for the opportunity that he gave us. A dear sister who attended Vera Wheeler, uh, here at First Baptist Church. I've known for the 52 years that I've been here in Canton. And she is a strong black woman, and I love her to death, and she's like a mom to me. And I remember when I came to First Baptist Church, she sent me a note one day, and the note said this, Obama in the White House and you at First Baptist Church, Lordy, Lordy. <laughs> what she was saying with this seems to be a time of impossibilities, and yet so it was. I know for a fact that it was hard for many when I came here that, that the older group, they weren't sure that if they died they wanted me to do their funerals and stuff because they just didn't know about me. And yet every one of those that had doubt when we ministered to them at that time, we did all of their funerals. And so as we have seen the things and the happenings in our country concerning the killing of George Floyd, we're reminded by these words. Former President Barack Obama had wrote these things uh, effecting real change after George's death. It said these, these words here. If we want to bring about real change, then the choice isn't between protests and politics. We have to do both. He said after releasing that statement about the police killing of George Floyd there in Minneapolis, the former president said, the bottom line is this, if we want to bring about real change, then the choice isn't between protests and politics, we have to do them both. We have to mobilize 
and raise awareness. And we have to organize and cast out ballots to make sure that we elect candidates who will act on reform. He went on to say that we need to urge, encourage and, uh, Americans to work together and create a, norm, a new normal. I looked at those words and I understand that no matter what we're going through today, everyone has used that term that we have to have a, we're going to be going through what, a new normal. And the new normal that he is talking about is the legacy of bigotry, unequal treatment, no longer infects our institutions or our heart. And that we would put up these things that would begin to make awareness to people that they would know the hearts of others. The point of protest is to raise uh, public awareness and to put a spotlight on injustice and to make the power that be uncomfortable. In fact, throughout America's history, it's only in response to protests that the political system has even paid attention to marginalized communities. He went on to say, but eventually aspiration has to be translated into specific laws and institutional practice and into the, a democracy that only happens when we elect government officials, officials who are responsive to our demands. And what he said was right. But what we find in this world also, and in this nation, putting laws on the books does not change the heart of man. It does not penetrate. It says what ought to be done, and yet we find that the events that we have been dealing with for the past weeks still happen. And so I struggled as people talk to me about what do we need to do when they talked about their hurts and their pains. And the only hope that I had for them was that it comes through Jesus. I didn't know any comforting words that would bring them hope and, on how to live and how to stand. I spoke to them not as if this did not affect me because I have children and I have grandchildren of color and great grandchildren. And I know what my grandbabies have gone through in their life and how it has affected them. But I've also been blessed to see how they've grown because why? They were told and, and, and given and then saw the examples that we can be all things. Even the President of the United States or the pastor of First Baptist Church. Because with God, all things are possible. In Matthew chapter 10, and Jesus warned the apostles, and we've been talking about this on our um, Wednesday night Bible study. And then we talked about it again uh, this past Sunday, and it talked about this. Jesus was sharing about them, about the persecution that was going to come upon them, and he was warning them. And he says, listen, I am sending you out like lambs, like sheep among the wolves. So be as clever as a snake and as innocent as a dove. Be careful of people because they will arrest you and they will take you to court and they will whip you in their synagogues. Because of me, you will be taken to stand before governors and kings and you will tell them and the non-Jewish people about me. Now see the difference between when we go and, and demonstrate and the instructions of Jesus said, that when we're going out, the message is not about all the things that you're doing to me. He said, make sure that you tell them about me. Because he understood that the only thing that changes life is him. The only thing that makes us understand that there's fault within me is him. The word of God and the spirit of God that is in us. And so he said, tell everyone about me. And in verse 19 of, of chapter 10 of Matthew, he said, and when you are arrested, he didn't say if you were arrested. When you are arrested, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. And at that time, you will be given the things to say. I will not, it will not really be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Jesus was saying in these times that no matter what we share and how eloquent that we can 
can do those things. We have to trust him so that even when we're talking about the hurts and pains in our life, we can also tell them about a peace that only he can give, a strength that only he can bring to us. And so he said that we would be speaking what the Spirit of God has given us through the truth of his word. Brothers will give their own brothers to be killed. And fathers will give their own children to be killed. And children will fight against their own parents and have them put to death. All people will hate you because you follow me. But those people who keep their faith until the end will be saved. And when you are treated badly in one city, he said, run to another. I tell you the truth. You will not finish going through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. I chose the scripture for that last scripture that was read. And Jesus was telling them that to be bold in him and their trust. And he says, and, and you, your life may be put on the line because you put your faith in me. And you will stand against injustice and all those things, but what you will stand on is the promises that come through me. But then he said to these Jewish believers and, and Gentile believers that as you go through the cities and as you finish going through the cities of Israel, it says they will not come to truth before the Son of Man comes. And Jesus was saying that no matter what we do, we need to understand these oppositions of life will be facing all of us until Jesus comes again. It doesn't matter who we are. Yeah, black lives matter. But Jesus is saying all lives matter. And that he wants all to come to the saving knowledge that is in him. And so as we looked at the scriptures of Colossians, and he's speaking to the church of Colossae, Paul was sharing with them about they had to guard their hearts about the opposition that would come. They would talk about those that would talk about themselves and, and share about themselves. And, and that they would say to them, I've had a vision, I've had uh, uh, an insight, and I'm able to tell you something that is even deeper than the Word of God. And here he's warning them to let them know there is no life apart from the Word of God and life in the Christ that is in us. And so in verse 13 of Colossians chapter 2, when you were spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were not free from the power of your sinful self, God made you alive with Christ, and he forgave all our sins. He canceled the debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. He took away that record with his rules and nailed it to the cross. God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority with the cross, and he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. When we looked at the scriptures, it reminds us that we were dead and separated from Christ. Last week we talked about that there has to be a circumcision of the heart, and not the circumcision of flesh. It is about the heart that allows us to come into the presence and, and to know that we need a Savior of Jesus called Jesus, the Lord, the Son of God. It told us that the place for every person before they are raised with him through faith in the working of God, that they need to have a new life. Going to church doesn't get us saved. Reading the Bible, quoting the scripture does not save us. It is when we have surrendered to the fact that we can't live this life right. We can't do the things that, that we need to, to do in ourselves, that only God can transform us. Because God is talking to us about something greater. He's not talking about just the success in this life. He is talking about to have eternal life, to have a right relationship with him. That I have to come to a saving life understanding that no matter what I do, I will never succeed without Jesus. I will never know how to love. I will never know how to forgive. I will not know how to stand. Now, these things are not just about um, the things that we have been talking about that black life matters. What he's talking about for mankind is that you will never get to the place you need to be without him being in your life. Now, I know for some you may be saying today, well, that's your belief, and, and then that's what you believe, but you can't make me believe that. 
Well, I'm going to tell you the truth. Nobody can make me believe it either. But one day I came to a saving knowledge and understanding because I looked at my life and I realized I was a train wreck. My life was uh, upside down. And it wasn't because I did not believe in Christ Jesus. I, did, I never applied what he had given me through his son. I tried to still be a good little boy. I tried to be a good man. But what I found in myself was that it was more than just going to church. It was more than just quoting the scriptures. It was more than uh, just uh, trying to be good. It was coming to the knowledge that without Christ, we can never overcome. We'll never be able to stand. We'll never be able to forget. We'll never be able to love. We'll never be able to do the things that we desire the most of, to love and to care for one another, to forgive as he has forgiven us. And so it says that we were dead and we were separated because Christ was not into our lives, but by faith and, and, and through him that we began to grow in him and that we understood that we were sick and we, uh, and a sick person needs a doctor and his name is Jesus. But it also said to us, it had to go one more step farther, that a dead person needed a savior. And when Jesus becomes the savior of your life, what happens to you and what happened to me was this. We came to a place that it was not about me living, it was about him living in us. That we have him in our life to guide us and, and to remind us about his goodness. And that we were made together with him. And it is true that he gave us life from the dead. He gave us pardon of sin. And he, and he gave us imputed righteousness. And these are all precious things, but at least not to contain them, to hold them, but we have to receive Christ himself, and that's where we struggle that. We have all tripped up because no one explained to us that we have to embrace Christ himself. It's not enough to say I'm saved if I'm not embracing him. Well, it's like this. Tomorrow I will be married 51 years. And it's not enough for me to say I love her. It's not enough for me to say that I'm sorry. It's not enough for me to say all the right things. What it needs from me is to embrace the things that I've spoken. And it's in those embraces, it's in those times that we begin to know that what comes from our lips is really the things that are in our heart. And when we begin to embrace Christ, we stop talking about that he is Lord. We begin to live like he is the Lord of our life. We begin to embrace him and begin to stand. And so what I found was that no matter how much I said I was sorry and meant it, she got tired of my sorries. She wanted to see the what? The proof that was in the pudding. And that's what the word of God is saying to us today. It's not enough that we say that we love the Lord. It's about us when we begin to demonstrate him and live for him, that others might see the crisis in us. It's in those changes in our life. We don't live a life in Christ that we will say, this way if they see me doing good, they'll know that my life is different. No, we don't do that. We live a life that's different because we see that through him we live. And then when we begin to embrace that, other people may notice that there's a difference in us. But we never go about it trying to change somebody's life. I will never be able to change a man that doesn't care for me because of the color of my skin, that I'm A-okay, I'm an all right guy. All I can do is just show him Christ. Show him the Christ that is in me. It's in those embraces there that they begin to see that there's something different about you and the difference of, uh, with me. A difference in all of us in this world. It's not enough for us to say all the right things. It's when we begin to embrace ourselves in him. That we become alive in him. And those things are, are, are what is important. For he has made us alive together in him. And we cannot make ourselves alive. But God can make us alive together with Jesus. And we can never be made alive apart from Jesus. We need him in every area of our lives. The new birth is him is that we've been made alive and we're cleansed and our sins are all forgiven. And the word of God reminds us that we go together as, as people 
and a new covenant that comes through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Old Testament reading out of Ezekiel, I read it last week, but I needed to read it again. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your uncleanliness and your idols. Also, I will teach you to respect me completely, and I will put a new way of thinking inside of you, and I will take out the stubborn heart of stone from your bodies. I will give you, I give you obedient heart of flesh. I will put my spirit inside of you, and I will make you live by my rules and carefully obey my laws, and you will live in the land I gave to your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. And in the New Testament, in John chapter 3, and Jesus said this, I will tell you the truth. Unless you are born from water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What it's saying is that unless you're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, unless you're washed in, in him, that washing uh, in the Old Testament was about purifying. It was about uh, purifying yourself that you may enter into the presence of God. So it says that when you enter uh, with water, it's talking about being purified, that you then can be in relationship with him. So it says born from water and spirit. It's not enough that we have to be uh, born through Jesus Christ or we can't enter the kingdom of God. We must be cleansed and purified through his love and the shedding of his blood and that his life has to be in us. And when we begin to do that, it says it wipes away all the requirements that were against me. See, when we talk about the law of the New Testament, they are sound, they are perfect in every way. The problem is, is that we can't live it. And it says that when you fail one part of it, you failed it all. And what it does bring to us is that we can't do this. Lord, I can't live good enough for you to say, I've lived perfect in such a way I can enter into your presence. No, it says when I allow my heart to be circumcised and, and I begin to understand that I cannot do this apart from you and that I need you in my life. It says there's a heart change. There's something that allows me to be able to do what I could not do. It begins to work against my thoughts, my ideas. It transforms me in every way. And in the midst of that, we begin to understand that the law was good, but it could not save. The promise of God is this, Jesus Christ alone, who died on the cross for your sins and for mine, was buried, rose again on the third day. And that when we put our faith and trust in him and the plan that God had for us, it says our lives will be changed forever. And so what I found was that for a change to come in me, I needed Jesus. I needed him to be God in every circumstance, situation that I found myself facing. So there's true life, and there's true life, and it only comes through Jesus. Living life is not living if you don't know him. Living life is not being uh, 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 able to forgive, love, walk in the strength and the power of trying to be good in this world because why? You are going to be tested. Testing is simple. Testing is simple. I, I talked with people over this past week and many uh, people uh, and some from the congregation here who are, who are white said, I never knew there was prejudice and I've lived here my whole life. And what they were saying was that I was surrounded. I was in a certain area. I ran with a certain group. We didn't talk that way. We didn't do that way. Our parents saw us different. And so we never came in contact with. But I also talked to many who were, were black and, and said, I never had any conflict. Well, I'm just going to tell you that um, I've not had many either. But if looks could kill, I would have been dead. They never said a word to me, but you could just tell by their look. The way they took the change or the money from my hand to put in the register. The way they looked at me when I came up on close or, or when I came into the room to pray for them. You could see that look on their face. Like, what are you doing here? And so what we find is that those things will not change without what? A heart change. Without a heart change. Because why? There's no good thing that dwells in us, the Bible says. And my thoughts and my ideas on how to do it. 
and what my thought and idea would be, if I never say it, if I never act it out, then they won't know that I can't stand them. But the truth of it is, you can't hide those things. They'll eventually come out. They'll just come out. And it may come out just as simple if I take the grocery cart you were looking to get. It's just something that simple. Just because why? It was rain. It was raining out and you wanted to get your cart so you could run into all these quick. And I was the person in front of you. And things would come out of your mouth just because over a cart. If you could have been guarded, you wouldn't have said it. If you would have done that, and this is what the Bible was talking about. Those things are in us, and we need a Savior. So true life can only come in Christ Jesus. I never can fake it enough. You know, fake it till you make it. You can't do that. You can't do that because why? It will eventually come out. The child who would say bad words or, or those things there or would mouth off would go out into a place and they would hope that the parent would not hear them. And being that child one day, I was far enough, I thought, from the house. And I knew that dad was in the other room. What I didn't know was that he had came out to the kitchen where the window was open. And when I walked in the house some hours later of cutting the grass that I didn't want to cut, and cut the grass while my cousin who was coming to visit was spending time with dad, and I felt that he never spent time with me. I was pulling on that lawnmower, and guess what? It did not want to start. And so I called that lawnmower a few things. And my dad said to me when I walked into the house, oh, mister, I didn't know you knew that kind of language. And I looked at him, and I said, what are you talking about? He said, I was at the window when you were out there trying to start the lawnmower. Hmm. See, it wasn't the first time that I had used language like that. But it was the first time he had ever heard me use language like that. What I'm saying is that there's things that we try to hide, things that we try to cover up. But there's always an incident that will come that will bring that part out of you. We need Jesus. And that's what... Paul was saying, saying to the church at Classe that he was telling them no matter what they find themselves going through, they need Jesus. They need the love of God. They need him to be God in every area and aspect of their life if they're going to overcome. It goes on to tell us in verse 16 of chapter 2, so do not let anyone make rules for you about eating and drinking or about religious feasts or new moons, festivals, or a Sabbath day. These things were like a shadow of what was to come. But what is true and real has come in and is found in Christ. That it tells us that it is not about these things that we do that make us feel good. And sometimes we get so caught up on the precious hymns of remembering what it was when we came up as, as children and how those songs meant so much to us. And then we hear the, the music that is played today and we're saying, oh God, that can't be you. That's got to be from the devil. But what I found out was that music that my mother liked, my grandmother didn't. And music that I liked, mom and dad didn't. And then the music that my kids liked, I didn't like. What I'm saying is that when you get old, there's some adjustments that have to be made. There's some things that, that come to, to fruition with us that we like the comfortableness of the things and being surrounded by the things that we like. And what Jesus is saying, you need to surround yourself with the one you need, which is him. That we need to understand that in this life you're going to be tested and, and tried but if that song is glorifying me, magnifying me, and that translation that you're reading it from, if it magnifies and glorifies me, let's not get caught up that it's not the King James Version that's been revised numerous times, and that if it was truly the Word of God written down the first time, he didn't have to come back and correct his mistakes. What I'm just saying is that sometimes we get caught up on things and we will stand and we will pound the table because we believe that thing is so right. And I'm just saying to you, find the word of God that makes sense to you. And then get with others and begin to share it with one another. 
Begin to encourage one another with the truth and begin to apply those principles to your life. And when you do, you will realize where your heart truly is at. And then when you're caught off guard, the only thing that we'll see is the light of Christ that is in you. That it won't matter about the time or day. We'll not wor worry about the circumstance situation. You will not know how to do anything but Jesus Christ who is your strength. But it's a daily thing. It's a, a daily walk with him. It is that time that we come together. And here he was just talking to them about food and drink, about different holidays and how they celebrate. And what they were trying to do is bring Old Testament law back into the church where Jesus has freed us from the law. The law was good. But for us to go back and say that I'm going to spend my days living out the law, I will find all it does is remind me that I cannot do it. And if that's all that it takes for me to, to go to Christ, I will fail miserably because I will never dot every I or cross every T. And so God is saying to us that you and I must walk and live and operate in the grace of God that comes to Jesus Christ our Lord. And he says, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. As a black man, I will speak up about those things. I shared with the group on that Tuesday night that I remember when I came to Canton at 17 and that a person came to me and walked up to me and when they heard my name and I said my name is Merle Bailey they looked at me and they said mm, you're not one of us and I said to them because those were during the time of of the death of Martin Luther King. It was during a time uh, where there had been the times of protest and, and different things were going on through our country. And this young man said to them, one of them, what? And they began to rattle off the different black families that are in Canton. They said, we know all of them. You're not one of them. That didn't sit well with me. It didn't sit well with me because why? Uh, it made them sound like this group of people, they were A-OK, -okay, but they were black. It meant that they only had a, a certain place of, of acceptance, but they were always going to be reminded that they were black. And there was being a favor given to them, because why? They said, we'll embrace your kind. Jesus is greater than that. He is greater than that, and that's what we're talking about. And Paul said, do not get caught up in the things that sound right and, and all of those things there. And what that began to do is bring an animosity out of me. It began to boil, cause a boiling in my blood when that person asked me those things. But what I forgot to say to them in that meeting that night was while I was going to school here in Canton, I was in a fraternity. And there was a store in town, and, and uh, a men's clothing store. And I tried to get an account there, and I had an account in the, in the men's stores there in, in Quincy, where I was brought up. And I gave them the reference and the phone number that they could call that place and let them know that I pay my bills and that, I, uh, that I'm trustworthy. And they just basically said they were not going to open up an account to me. And when I had shared this with my brothers who were white and were raised in Canton, and those 12 went down to that store and said to them, this is our brother, and if you don't open an account for him, we will never buy anything in your store again. And we will tell everyone that we know not to shop here. And amazingly, all of a sudden, I qualified for an account. Over the years to come, a relationship began to build between the owners and myself. And where I had been given a small limit, I had come to a place that I had no limit at all. All I said was that there was people that rallied around, and they said, except... And they looked at me and they saw no color. And many of those gentlemen were in our wedding 51 years ago. But when I'm reminded through my children and grandchildren that the struggles are still there, 
But as I said earlier, without Jesus, nothing changes. Nothing changes in their hearts or changes in ours. Nothing begins to happen that will glorify. And so he's warning the church, do not get caught up in these things because people will say to you, you need to be like this if you're going to be strong. And Jesus is saying that if we're going to be strong, we're going to have to fight against the opposition that goes against the teaching of his word. Where he said, love as I have loved you, forgive as I have forgiven you. And that I came that what none should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. And so he was warning the church of Colossae, guard your heart for those things because there's those that will talk about things, but there's no substance in it. They will talk to you about what God has revealed to them, but you can't find it in the book. You will not find it in the teachings of Jesus. You will not find it in those 66 books that have been written called the Bible. He said you need to guard your heart against these people because when they talk about the visions and the things that have been revealed to them, they say it in a puffed up manner. That same puffed up manner is that I've never let one of them into my house. I've never allowed one of them to do this. Or I've never allowed anyone to say this or, or be part of that. But he says, don't allow that to affect your heart. And I'm saying to you today, if you've been raised that way and you've been changed, all you can say is, it's because of Jesus. Because I'm going to say this as well. My mother was raised in Missouri. My dad was raised 18 miles away in Quincy. And my dad was treated a little different coming up in a, a non-slave state compared to my mother, raised only 18 miles away. And I watched Mary Bailey grow from a strong dislike for whites to understanding that she had grandchildren and great-grandchildren that were mixed. And she had to move past the hurts that she had received in her life. The things that had happened to my grandfather, her dad, and the things that happened to her brothers. She had to look past those things because why? God was doing a new thing. That it wasn't about that you had to marry within yourself. You had to find someone that would love you as you loved them. And then it didn't matter where they came from. It was a matter of the fact that they became family. And that's what Paul is sharing with us, he's reminding us is that we need to be careful because thoughts and ideas, hurts and pains of others will try to impact our lives, but we have to guard ourselves and stand on the truth of Christ that he might hold us and, and keep us. And in verse 18, he says, do not let anyone disqualify you by making you humiliate yourself and worship angels. Some such people enter into visions which fill them with foolish pride because their human way of thinking. They did not hold tightly to Christ, the head. It is from him that all the parts of the body are cared for and held together. So it grows in the way God wants it to grow. And that there was this false teaching that caused them to put hope and trust in what we call a guardian angel. I've heard so many people say that I have a guardian angel. And that it was said when Peter was set free from prison and he walked out and the angel had released him and those things there. And when he knocked on the door of the house uh, uh, that he was there to visit because he, he knew that the brothers and sisters were inside praying for him, he knocked on the door and the girl opened, looked out the window, and she saw through the gate that it was Peter. She didn't unlock the gate. She ran back, and she told them, Peter is at the gate. And they said, oh, you just saw his angel. You just saw a vision of him. Peter's dead. Herod killed him just as he killed James. That was their thought and their idea. What they thought was that God was not greater than that. And they prayed, and, and what they found out, they they prayed, but they didn't believe that God would answer their prayer because they knew that Peter was up against something that was impossible for him to escape. Herod had two guards on his hand and two standing at the door. 
And Peter wasn't going to walk out of the jail like he did before. He was going to be tested and he was going to be tried and he was going to be killed. And yet he was standing at the gate. I'm just saying to you today, don't let anyone tell you that God has not set you free. And you don't have to put your hope in Grandma looking down upon you and she's making a way for you. Grandma's not looking down upon you and she's not making a way for you. Grandma would say to you, I'm seeing you, but I want you to see the one who makes a way and his name is Jesus. And that's what he was saying to them. That do not put your hope and trust when people tell you about these things. You do not have a guardian angel. You have a savior who died for you and he is your strength. And so we need to guard our hearts. Guard our thoughts and our ideas. We need to stand in a way that allows us to glorify and magnify God in our coming and in our going. And in verse 20 and 23 it reads, Since you died with Christ and were made free from the ruling spirits of the world, why do you act as if you still belong to this world by following its rules? Like these. Don't handle this. Don't taste that. Don't even touch that. Don't hang with those people. Don't run with them. Be careful who you run with. Now those ain't in there, but it's the same thing. It was saying to them, be careful when people begin to give you these rules that refer to earthly things that are gone on. And as soon as they use them and say them, those words have no substance. They tell you don't eat it, don't drink it, don't taste it, don't run with this one, don't run with that. But the truth is, after he said, there's no power with it. It says don't eat it, but Jesus said to Peter, eat it all, and because don't call what I have created unclean. And he was talking about people, you and I. You died with Christ from the basic principles of this world, remembering this, that the key to living above legalism, the thoughts and ideas of men, our definition is with Jesus. Our identity is with him. And he has both what? Died for us, rose from the grave, and he lives again. We are with him. And we are all that he has called us to be. The word reminds us that they had these rulers who referred to earthly things that had gone on and soon to be used up. They are only human commands and teachings. They seem to be wise, but they're only part of a human religion. There are things that things are said, and we do as Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, different denominations, but none of them have anything to do with Jesus. It's just the rituals that we've done, and they're good, they're not bad, but they're not life's changing. And he says, don't hold on to those things. Because let's not get caught up in sprinkling or immersion. The bottom line is, has the heart been circumcised? Has the heart been circumcised? And that's what he's telling us today. And so in that scripture, they make people pretend not to be proud and make them punish, uh, punish their, bi their bodies. They do... Uh, but they do not really control the evil desires of the sinful self. He has said to them that you can try to do all the things that they add to your walk with Christ, but they will not take care of the evil desires that is in us. It's only Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if I take communion once a year, once a month, or every week. It's not about taking the communion that transforms your life. It is he who died, who was buried and rose again, that changes our lives forever. And so we're encouraged today by the word of God. We're encouraged today to stand strong in him. And yet we know that Jesus said in his word that Israel would never come to the saving knowledge but continue to go because people will come to the saving knowledge if we will witness the truth to them. And what he was saying to them, the nation will, but not until he returns. There will be hope for others, but it won't be until Jesus 
returns. And all I can say to you, let's keep doing what God has called us to do. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. 
for your love that has no end. We're thankful for the word of God that is life to us, that gives us hope in the testing times of life that we find ourselves living through. We are going to overcome. We will be victorious, but it may not happen until Jesus comes. But let us be faithful to put our hope and our trust in him, that we stand on the word, and we will not let anything, no outward, out, outward form, word spoken, people saying, control or conduct our lives. We will stand on the word of God and the finished promise that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We will stand on those things and we will praise him all the days of our life. And yes, we live in a battle, this battle called life. And that's what we're dealing with. We're just dealing with life. Ugly as it is, we still need to have our distancing. We still need to do all of those things. But we need to know that when you have Jesus, he will give you everything you need to live a life victoriously. So let your light so shine that people will see the good works of Christ in you. Make a difference. Be that beacon, that word that will encourage others. Stand strong in him and know with him there's no weapon that is formed that will prosper against you. And so, Father, we thank you today for your life that is in us. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. And, Lord, and I pray this morning, Lord, for those who may be struggling, that, Lord, that they would hear your word and they would let you do in their heart what only you can do. We believe, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, in this great salvation. And we believe, Lord, that you've called us at such a time as this to let the light so shine. And so I say thank you, Jesus, that you would dare use us to impact the world and the city and the homes that you put us in contact with for your praise and for your glory. Be with us, go with us as we go from here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen.